to uh, so fascinating and interesting talk. And uh, as you see, the, the title of my talk has the word basic in it. So uh, I hope uh, it will not be too basic, but uh, I think uh, <coughs> there are also uh, many young people in the room. Someone could be somewhat uh, naive to mechanical ventilation. So I, I think uh, I would like to set the grounds for what will be the work of uh, the next uh, couple of days. <coughs> my uh, conflicts of interest that, that really have nothing to do with the talk I will be giving today. So the scenario I will present you uh, is, and I want to uh, be clear on that, is the situation where there is an absence of respiratory effort for the patient, either because we gave him narrow muscle blocking agent for any reason, but uh, most of the things I will show you today have to do with the situation where the patient is not breathing at all. And so we are fully controlling the ventilation. I would like to stress, uh, uh, well, here I put physician, but uh, uh, could be a respiratory therapist, but in any case, uh, of the clinician who is in charge of the patient through the ventilator. And, and the breathing is not controlled by the ventilator itself, by, but, but by the clinician who is managing the ventilator. So <coughs> again, uh, it's, uh, it's a very uh, basic talk. Which modes do we currently have to uh, set our mechanical ventilators? We do have uh, all the modes where we set a volume, uh, which have different names depending on the brands, and this is something I will refer to today. Uh, there's no such a thing in ventilation like a generic uh, name like we have for drugs. So depending on the type of machine you use, uh, very similar ventilation could have very different names. So, uh, but basically we have types of ventilation where we target a volume, a tidal volume. Uh, we have uh, modes of ventilation where we target a given inspiratory pressure. So all the pressure control ventilations, which have much more different names, uh, where the nomenclature is more variegate than for volume control. And then we have something which is in between, and I will get uh, to these modes by the end of my talk, which are uh, modes of ventilation, which uh, seems to work like pressure control but in fact, our uh, target is a tidal volume. And I will uh, uh, get to this uh, by the end. So three uh, main categories. And so I will start from uh, uh, the, the first one, which is volume control ventilation. Uh, just a few words on how uh, mechanical ventilators nowadays work. I will refer to uh, mechanical ventilators for uh, ICU. And basically, all the ventilators uh, work uh, with the gas inlet coming from the wall. There are ventilators that have a, a pump inside, by, but most ventilators for ICU come uh, have their pressure source in the uh, wall, in the centralized or in a tank. But basically, the, the, what drives the, the, the gas is the pressure coming from outside the ventilator. And so what the ventilator controls, basically the main controls are two valves. One which regulates the inspiration from the pressure, pressure source towards the patient, which is open during inspiration. And the other one, the expiratory valve, which is closed during expiration, that op uh, sorry, it's closed during inspiration and opens during expiration that allows the flow to get out of the patient uh, to the atmosphere. So all, the ventila all uh, that the ventilator controls is flow. Uh, and of course, based, uh, the ventilator controls the valves the, based on two factors, one being our um, setting of the ventilator and the other one being the signal that are coming from the pressure sensors which are located on Two, on the two inspiratory and expiratory line and sometimes even on the, on the Y. And this is very important for pressure control ventilation, but always keep in mind that everything that the ventilator does, can do, is to allow flow to move towards the patient or back from the patient. So when we work with volume controlled ventilation, we have two main settings, of course. Uh, uh, 
which are tidal volume uh, and respiratory rate, being tidal volume, the amount of air which is delivered at every breath, times respiratory rate, sum up to the minute ventilation, which is actually the most important parameter for CO2 removal. Plus, we have a bunch of other knobs <coughs> which mainly set the time over which inspiration and expiration occur, and we have positive and expiratory pressure. Now, I would like to say a couple of words on the equation of motion of respiratory system. I don't want to scare you or to uh, be too complicated, but I think it's important where we l when we look at airway pressure to understand what is the meaning of the pressure we are looking at. So what the ventilator monitors, the, the only thing that the ventilator can monitor is the pressure at the airway opening, whether it monitors it inside uh, whether it monitors it at the Y, sometimes it monitors at the tip of the endotracheal tube, but we are still looking at the pressure outside the patient, okay? Not, sorry, not inside the patient. We are looking at the pressure at the airway opening. Now, with every ventilatory mode you use, if the patient is on controlled ventilation, this airway opening pressure is the sum of two components. So it's very, very easy because for lazy people like me, once you've learned the equation of motion of respiratory system, you've learned all that you need for respiratory mechanics, nothing more. So it's, it's very convenient, I, I suggest you. Uh, and, and so two components. One is the amount of pressure that we have to pay to blow our flow through the uh, tubes. So it's a resistive pressure. We have the endotracheal tube, the trachea, blah, blah, blah. And so when we want to move the flow, we have to do this through a resistance. And we have to spend a given amount of pressure to do that. It's the resistive pressure, which is in green here. And then we have the elastic recoil pressure of the lung, which I will come back to in a matter of, of minutes. If the patient is spontaneously breathing, it's very simple. You just add here the amount of pressure generated by the patient, but this is not uh, uh, the topic for today. So now let's focus for a minute on the resistive pressure. Imagine you have a ventilator and you just have connected to it a resistance, so like an endotracheal tube and nothing else, okay, like the atmosphere. And you just start to deliver a square uh, flow, like what you would do in volume control. If you look at the pressure that the ventilator is measuring proximally to the resistance, you will see the pressure which is necessary to overcome this resistance. So you will see a square pressure which has exactly the same shape of the flow because it's the amount of pressure that is required to blow this flow through the tube. When the flow gets to zero, the pressure gets to zero. So the resistive pressure has much to do with the dynamic, with the movement of flow. But in our condition, usually, we do not have the ventilator open to atmosphere. Yeah, this is what I was showing. We do not have the ventilator open to atmosphere. We have an elastic body that Professor Gattinoni has explained uh, very well. We have an elastic body connected to <coughs> the ventilator which is the lungs, the respiratory system of our patient. And for the sake of, of, uh, of uh, clarity, I would consider it as it was just one big elastic body. In fact, if all the alveoli have the same time constant, blah, 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 we can uh, consider this assumption true. But we do have an elastic body, okay? And so as soon as I blow my gas through the tube in the lung, the lung uh, will respond with an elastic recoil pressure because the lung wants to, co to go back to its resting volume, to its resting volume. So as soon as the flow uh, is delivered <coughs> through, the, uh, through the airways into the alveoli, we will see that the pressure here goes up. The pressure has two components. One in red is the resistive pressure, which is constant, because the amount of flow I'm blowing through the tube is constant, but the elastic recoil pressure will go up and up 
and up because the volume is increasing. So you see the elastic recoil pressure, the red pressure here, has exactly the same shape of the volume because the elastic recoil pressure, which is the pressure inside the alveolus, is due to the volume. We are distending the lung. And so at the given point, I get to what we call an inspiratory hold, which we can have or, uh, in some modes uh, already it in every tidal volume, or we just push the button and we see it. <coughs> and uh, this elastic, uh, this pressure, which is called plateau pressure, uh, is due only to the elastic component of the lung. This of the respiratory system, sorry. This is the alveolar pressure is the pressure which the alveolus sees, is the pressure that the alveolus has to bear. The alveolus will never see this green pressure here because it's the pressure that we spend to drive the flow towards the alveolus. This is a pressure that the ventilator see, sees but which is dissipated along the airway. The alveolus is only seeing the red pressure here. And so getting to the point in volume control, uh, it's important to remember that we do have a peak pressure which includes both the resistive component to flow and the elastic recoil. You see here it's, it's this green part is sitting on top, uh, on top on the, of the red one. And then as soon as the flow stops, we will only have the elastic component which is the pressure that the alveolus is seeing during controlled ventilation. Now, <coughs> I will not go into this because I'm, I'm sure uh, Alain Mercat will do a, a great job in the, in the next talk on, on respiratory mechanics monitoring, but the bottom line of this slide is that if anything in the properties of the lung, of the tube, of blah, blah, blah changes, what we will see in volume control ventilation is a change in pressure. So in volume control, our independent variable is flow and hence volume, and the pressure is a, a measured variable, okay? Anything that happens will change this dependent variable that we measure. So uh, again, I, I'm not going into this, but peak and plateau pressure will change but the volume will stay the same because it's volume control. Now, if we move to pressure control, which again uh, has a different, uh, is called in very different ways according to the ventilators, our independent variable becomes pressure. So the ventilator will still manage flow because it's the only thing that the ventilator can do but it will manage flow to reach a given pressure which we set. And talking about the names, uh, if the patient is sedated and paralyzed, or in any case is not breathing, any uh, ventilatory mode, pressure control, BiPAP, BiPAP assist, APRV, blah, blah, they are all exactly the same. The main difference be, um, begins when the patient starts to breathe. And, but this is uh, another topic. So I will say pressure control here, but if your ventilator calls it BiPAP, it's exactly the same if the patient is sedated and paralyzed. So as I said, here, this should blink, here the ventilator is still controlling flow because it's the only thing the ventilator can do, but it will control it <coughs> to reach not a given flow, not a given tidal volume, but to modulate airway pressure according to what we say. And this can be done because of course, there is a mathematical relationship. So the ventilator will adjust instant by instant the flow so to get to the airway pressure we want to have. The equation of motion <coughs> I've shown you works exactly in the same way I mean, it's not working exactly the same way, but it's valid exactly in the same way also during pressure control ventilation. So the amount of airway pressure, which in, uh, in uh, pressure control is now square and flat, is still 
the sum of these two components, the resistive pressure and the elastic pressure. It's still the same. In pressure control, in volume control, it doesn't change anything. But what's the trick? The trick is that in the beginning of inspiration, the alveolus is empty. So airway pressure go from PEEP, let's say five, to peak inspiratory pressure, which is, let's say, 25. So there is a big gradient of pressure between the airways and the alveolus. And so we have a huge peak flow that comes from the ventilator to the alveolus. One instant after, and there should be a line here, what happens? It happens that, th that this flow, okay, distends the alveolus. And so the alveolus starts to have an elastic recoil pressure. Once again, wants to go back to its uh, um, resting volume. So the pressure we can spend to generate flow is smaller. We have less pressure available because now the pressure in the alveolus is higher, the pressure in the airways is the same, and so the flow starts to decrease. So all ventilatory modes that have a flat pressure are, have the same uh, flow pattern, a decelerating flow pattern. Why is the flow going down? It's going down because we have more and more pressure in the alveolus, which is here in red, and less and less pressure is available to generate flow. And at the end, maybe, and this is an important maybe, I think, the pressure in the airways and the alveolus are the same. So there is no more flow. And in this situation, the pressure we read in the airway is the same pressure which we read in the, al which we have in the alveolus. So keep in mind that as far as the flow is zero, the pressure you read in the ventilator is the same that you have in the alveolus. If the flow is not zero, the pressure cannot be the same. The pressure you're reading in the ventilator can be higher, can be lower, but it cannot be the same that you have inside the lung. Otherwise, there would be no flow. <coughs> so if the mechanical properties of the lung change during pressure control, the pressure by definition will not change because it's pressure control. What will change sometimes is the tidal volume. <coughs> I, I think, uh, once again, Alan will, will uh, show you about uh, monitoring in, in a matter of minutes, but uh, I think it's important also to understand how pressure control ventilation works. So is this a plateau, pre this is uh, on a dragger, it's called BiPAP, but it could be pressure control. Do you think this is a plateau pressure? How many of you think this is plateau pressure? Raise your hands. Nobody? Okay, very good. Why is that? It's because we still have a flow here. So this means that there is still a pressure gradient between the airways and the alveolus. Also in pressure control ventilation, to measure the plateau pressure, the real alveolar pressure, we need to have the inspiratory pose. We need to have the flow zero. Otherwise, there's no way we measure the pressure inside the alveolus. I think this is a frequent misunderstanding with pressure modes, uh, pressure cycle ventilation, because not because the pressure is flat, it means it is a plateau pressure. <coughs> So pressure control ventilation is tricky. There are many, many factors that affect our tidal volume. One is the uh, mechanical properties of the lung because we set the pressure. So if I set 20 centimeters of water pressure, the tidal volume I get will be very, very different depending on resistance and compliance that of the patient. But the other one is also the inspiratory time. Why is that? <coughs> Look at this situation, same lungs, same everything. This is a pressure control with an inspiratory time of 0.8 seconds, okay? And tidal volume is 439. You see that we still have some flow at the end of inspiration. What does this mean? 
that we, if we give more time, if we keep our pressure for a longer time, the flow will go on and the tidal volume will increase. And this is exactly what happens if we increase the inspiratory time. You see, tidal volume goes up and up again, but at some point, we reach an equilibrium between the airway and the alveolus, so the tidal volume does not increase anymore because we basically get to a plateau pressure. And so there is no more uh, delta pressure between the airway and the alveolus. And so you see that here, 509, we basically have no flow at the end of inspiration and tidal volume, if we further increase tidal vo um, inspiratory time, stays the same. But there is another trick with pressure control, which is that if the inspiratory time is too long, we do not have enough time for the lungs to exhale. And so what happens is that <coughs> there is what we would call an intrinsic peak, and there are, will be speeches on the entire topic, on, on this topic, but just to show you that if we have an intrinsic peak, we do not have time for the lungs to exhale. And so the, the difference between uh, my alveolar pressure and the pressure in the ventilator will be smaller because of this intrinsic peep, and so the tidal volume will start to drop and drop again. So the bottom line is that uh, inspiratory time, depending also on the mechanical properties of the lungs, will uh, greatly affect tidal volume in pressure control mode. Just a word, uh, because I think this is also some, somewhat a, a frequent mis, uh, source of confusion in, in trials, uh, having just completed the lung safe study, this was, a, this was a trick part. What is APRV? Maybe you use it already, a APRV stands for Airway Pressure Release Ventilation. So this is the idea of the APRV. You have a very long inspiratory time and a very short expiratory time. This is the way APRV is desi was, desi was invented, was designed. But the fact that the ventilator says APRV does not mean that we are talking about the same thing because I can set the, uh, the ventilator knobs in this way, so that APRV becomes exactly like pressure control. So I think this is also a frequent source of confusion that APRV, it's just a name, but the concept of APRV is very different, is a highly inverse ratio ventilation. So much so that I can do the same with another name, with BiPAP, and if the patient is passively uh, ventilated, is not breathing, this or this will be exactly the same, the first and the third one, despite the fact that they have different names. So w when we talk about APRV, we have to make sure that we are reasoning on, on a, a ventilation with a very inverse IE ratio. And again, this has to do with the fact that sometimes names uh, instead of, of making things easier, complicate things a little bit. Uh, in the last, uh, I think, three minutes of my talk, maybe four, uh, I would like to allude a little bit on this issue uh, of pressure control versus volume control. First thing is, I'm, I'm not sure it's such an important question. I think both have advantages and disadvantages. It's, it's important that we know the features of the ventilation we want to use, their uh, advantages, their disadvantages. But I will, uh, there are studies that show, and it, I, I, th I would be surprised if it was the, the other way around, that in terms of clinical outcome, they are basically the same. But so first, very important concept is peak inspiratory pressure will be very different between uh, pressure control and volume control, but peak inspiratory pressure is not seen by alveoli. Alveoli do see plateau pressure. And plateau pressure, if the tidal volume is the same and mechanical properties of the lung are the same, compliance is the same, will be exactly the same value in pressure control and in volume control. So 
this is, I think, very, very important. There's no reason why plateau pressure, why alveolar pressure at the end of inspiration should be different between volume control and pressure control. As far as tidal volume is the same, of course. <coughs> there are differences, of course. In the, the, the main difference stands in the shape of the flow, which is square in most of the volume control modes, but it's decelerated in the pressure controlled modes. Now, there are authors that say that this could be a source of uh, ventilator-induced lung injury because we are stretching rapidly the lung, and maybe Professor Gattinoni will uh, want to comment on the role of peak inspiratory flow on, as a source of, of VILI. On the other hand, uh, it has also been shown that all the alveoli with pressure control ventilation with this decelerated flow have more time to get to the equilibrium with the airways to receive tidal volume. And this, in this quite old paper done by uh, I'm, some uh, eminent <laughs> uh, workers at my institution, uh, it was shown that indeed uh, pressure control might allow a better CO2 clearance than volume control because of a more homogeneous spread of ventilation. The third uh, thing, though, is this one. I am a bit, uh, I would not say scared, but not so confident with uh, pressure modes, with uh, simple pressure modes, because the tidal volume is not guaranteed. Uh, so it could happen that the patient has, say, let's just uh, take out from the, the scenario from RDS. Think about the COPD patient. Uh, the, the bronchospasm comes and goes, intrinsic PEEP will change, resistance will change, and in pressure control you have huge changes in tidal volume. So I think this is something we have to be careful, very careful about when we use pressure control modes. One ventilation, and this is the end of my talk, that brings together the advantages of a constant tidal volume and a decelerated flow is the so-called uh, pressure uh, regulated volume controlled, volume guaranteed. Once again, many names for the same thing. Uh, companies help us in having a common names for the things that are in fact the same. Auto flow on, on dragger ventilators, but they are all the same, which is the idea that I'm giving to, the, to my ventilator a, ventilator a target of tidal volume. I want to have, say, 500 milliliters. So you see, this is volume control, 500 milliliters. But then the ventilator will work in pressure control. And within given limits, it is allowed to change the inspiratory pressure. <coughs> Here we switch. So that you see, this is pressure control, same tidal volume. Here something changes, say, we have a mucus plug. The ventilator, the tidal volume drops. And in response to that, the ventilator will bring up inspiratory pressure to keep the same tidal volume. Same tidal volume. Here we uh, improve the patient condition. Tidal volume for this reason goes up. And so the ventilator will step back and bring back the tidal volume to the previous uh, level. So it's a kind of a pressure control mode, but when our target is not pressure, it's tidal volume. So the conclusions is that they uh, volume control and pressure control have very different working principles, but they work on the same system with the same rules, the same equations. So lead ultimate can lead ultimately to the same result. We have to be sure of the caveats with each type of ventilation, and there are hybrid modes that uh, share the main advantages of both. And uh, this is my last slide. This is a YouTube channel we set up uh, about mechanical ventilation. It's, uh, you just go on YouTube and type uh, U-Vent. And there are videos. Uh, more will come. So I invite you to visit our channel. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Giacomo.